You know that part in the main episode where Bethany put the vintage radio over what we were saying? <laughs> <laughs> That's because I said, I think that what really happened is that Kick saw her freaking opportunity to sign herself into a royal family. We need to talk about the Kennedy siblings. Episode 8. Welcome to Blood and Business. I'm Bethany. And I'm Cassie. The biggest question. Did Kick actually love Billy? And was she capable of love in general? Well... According to Barbara Leeming, which she is a historian who wrote the book Kick Kennedy, Evelyn Waugh jested that she was in love with him, that Kick was in love with Billy. But Barbara Leeming says, quote, Waugh was partly right. Kick had fallen in love with the world of Westminster. Boom. Drop, drop the mic. Case. Oh. oh, my Lord. I can't talk. Boom, <laughs> drop the mic, case closed. <laughs> Kick had fun with Billy. Yeah. The question is, did Kick love Billy in a real sense? Selflessness, commitment, that type of love, and then just wasn't in love with him? Like the infatuation mm-hmm. feelings? Kick even told John White, I'm like Jack, incapable of true love and affection. She knew. That there was just, it just wasn't at the level that other people experienced love. Yeah. Let, okay. So those quotes from episode seven, when she's talking about, he loves me so much. It's such a thing. Like he won't get married if I'm around. Uh-huh. She knew how much he loved her and she wasn't saying it's mutual. She was commenting on his love for her. Right. And it did not sound like it was coming from someone who also felt that way. The tone was not someone in love. No, it was an observer. Someone very removed from the emotions of the situation. Then she's talking to Jack and she's saying, hey, if I do marry this Billy guy, I'm going to get all these castles and I will be able to take care of you guys in your old age. She's worried about her inheriting things and taking care of her brothers. She's not saying, I will get to spend the rest of my life with my best friend. I love him so much. I cannot wait. Let's just indulge ourselves a little. Let's just think that maybe the whole reason that Kick married Billy was to bear a male heir and successfully and permanently induct herself into the second most powerful family in all of Great Britain. And now, to ensure that you stay well-fed, here is your conspiracy of the week. First of all, we have the fact that she, when she's talking about Billy, she never talks about him like, I am so happy to be with him. It's always, he loves me. I Plus, feel look good. at all these estates. Yeah. <laughs> then she doesn't have any of her friends come to her wedding at all. Nobody who would just be a purely emotional connection other than Joe Jr. I think that's a huge freaking red flag. She's kind of trying to like reach out to all these really respected women who are high up in British society to like stand by her. She invites, quote unquote, important people only. Lady Astor. The first member, woman member of parliament and Marie Bruce. Which we know Lady Astor is the opposite of Kick's beliefs. First of all, what she, what she claims are her beliefs Lady Esther is the freaking Nazi headquarters for all of Great Britain and not Catholic. And that's the thing. I Okay, so let's talk about the rushed wedding because I literally said as I was writing the script, I'm like, my stomach hurts. I want to go home. (laughs) Like it's, it just felt like a betrayal of herself. It felt rushed. And I feel like in the episode, it sounded like Cassie and I are anti-eloping or anti-going to the courthouse. No, if that's what you not want to do, amazing. And it, probably if I could go back, I probably would have done a lot smaller of a little thing and I would have gone somewhere on a vacation. Just for who Kick was and what she loved most, which was going to parties, going to balls, Fashion. being a socialite, 
she loved all of the like even grandeur. attention. Yeah, the attention. She would be the one to enjoy planning it, to enjoy being the bride. And really take a moment. It just felt like she didn't even, even within herself, she didn't take a moment to respect their relationship or honor it, you know? But I, I, part of me thinks it was because if she would have let herself slow down and really think about it and have months and months to like curate this wedding Mm. and to host everyone and to have all of her family and friends there to see her, A, too many people would be telling her, don't do this. And she didn't want to deal with that. And B, she would have to face it herself. And it's like she knew. She didn't want that guilt. She didn't want that on her chest. She just wanted to go through it. Like, hurry up, get the wedding over with. Okay, now I'm married to him. So I just have to do what I have to do now. Instead of letting it be like a slow process to where she could really think about it, think about what she was doing, for what reason, and then feel the guilt of her impure intentions, kind of. Before we talk about the wedding ceremony, I guess let's back up. Leading up to the wedding, it was just so, I mean, they literally got engaged. Two days later, they're married. She doesn't even have her freaking own underwear. She doesn't have a wedding dress. She She has nothing. I would think she finally had decided, all right, yep, bang the gavel. I need my fate to be sealed before this dude goes and dies because he's the oldest Cavendish boy, which means whoever marries him is going to be the Duchess of Devonshire, Lady Hardington. There's so much that comes with marrying him. And like we said, even if Billy was a dud, there would have been crowds of women lined up, ready to marry him, no matter what he looked like, acted like, it doesn't matter. Just what came with marrying him and and kick knew that. She grew up in a powerful family. She grew up in high society. She freaking knows what that is worth. And she knows about position. And she knew exactly what would have been expected of her. And she knew exactly what would have been waiting for her on the other side of signing that dotted line. And she was absolutely obsessed with British culture. Like she, that was the life that she wanted. She wanted to be in the British high society. And if you look at how she was acting when she was still in America while the war was happening, the entire time, there's no, I just want to be with Billy. Can he come over here? What if he dies in the war? What if he has to get shipped off? Like, am I going to be able to marry him? What? She's not dealing with this Protestant Catholic question when she has to be in America. The entire time, she's complaining, 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 complaining about not being able to be in England, not being able to be with her friends in England, not being able to fight in the war in England, not being able to party in England. (laughs) Like she tells her dad, I voted that America should get involved in the war to back up England. Like she just wants to be there. The one consistent desire, the thing that she's most persistent about is not love, is not faith, is not her family. It is about being in England. The whole time she's in England, she's content. The whole time she's in America, she's upset about not being in England. And even after Billy dies, where does she go? There's nothing else tying her to England. She should be, okay, back to, I mean, my love died. Now back to everything else I love, which is my family, America, Catholicism, da, da, da. No, 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 no. Billy's death made her life different in almost no way. Obviously, she was really, really sad. And she did go through a depression after Billy died. So it wasn't that like she just went on, like nothing happened. I just mean in her circumstances, in the way that she's living her life, because if she and Billy had been together for a freaking long time, then the life that she would have been comfortable with and acclimated to would have been a life with the Cavendishes, a life in Chatsworth, et cetera. But it wasn't. So It wasn't that she just like, okay, she continued on living where she was living because that's what she was used to, that she she was comfortable with. I don't know. You would just think that in a moment of distress that she would want to go back to like the comfort of your family that you're close to, unless you were like super close to your in-laws. But like that was all so new to her. That wasn't her family. That wasn't someone that she had spent years with. She also didn't have children because that would make sense as well. I don't want to uproot my whole family yeah, they need and stability. move them back. Yeah, they need stability. Or if she had a job even. 
some something tying her there. Yeah. She literally has nothing, nothing to do every day. And if she wasn't... And she's so distraught that she can't even sleep by herself. And she goes back home and is with her family when Joe Jr. passes. Right. So it's not like they don't bring her any comfort. She is super close to her family. She loves them because that would also make sense. Why would I go back home? I don't really have a relationship with my family. I don't enjoy being around them. I just, I, I don't know. It's like she want, she just still wanted that life even without Billy, you know? And maybe I don't know all of the nuances of higher class, like upper class culture or British culture or even just how things were, you know, what was it? 75 years of? ago. Yeah. Um, because maybe she should have stayed with her, her husband's family. But it says that in The Kennedy Women by Lawrence Lemer. Well, I guess this is next episode. But when she dies, it's painted that she stayed in England because she was just a mourning widow that wanted to be where her husband was, et cetera. But that that was not the reality. That was not the truth. So I can't say what her motivations were. I can't say that she wasn't just trying to, you know, feel close to Billy or something like that by staying in England. But from the sources that I've read, it seems like it's pretty widely speculated and thought that that was not Kicks motivations. And you'll see what she does in like about a year's time in the next episode. And that also kind of infers some things. Leading up to the ceremony, why would they even freaking get married? I think she thought, you know what? This dude is obsessed with me. He'll for sure marry me. And he's about to go off to war. He could die in war. Why don't I, if he's going to die in war, why don't I go ahead and be married to him? So that if he's gone, I'll freaking get everything I want. I'll get the notoriety. I'll get the position. I will get the power. I'll get the estates. I'll get the money. Posi- yeah, like the respect and the position, the money. If I let this dude go off to war and he dies and I didn't, wh- I will literally be so upset. Like I will miss my opportunity. This narrative is honestly horrible. I feel like me and Cass were like, should we even talk about this? Because it's yeah, it so mean. It feels so bad. Gross. But it's honestly just an extreme version of what we had already talked about in the Jackie and Lee episodes. It's episode two, I think, where she gets with Jack and we talk about her motivations in getting married to JFK and that it was probably more likely that it was a career and like lifestyle move than it was just pure love. And this is very, very common. Like, it's not like just the Kennedys were like this. I think that a lot Especially of- Especially high society. Right. A lot of high society. And then people like Kris Jenner. That's what I was going to say. Even the Kardashian story, it was yeah. this as well. I'm sure this is centuries and centuries and centuries of, of people marrying to move up like, the ladder. Yeah. It's just, a, it's a long story. I and, mean, and the Cavendish in, family, the yes. men married women to to inherit estates so that they could have more money. And in the episode one of the Kennedy siblings, we talk about how Honey Fitz didn't want Rose to marry Joe Jr. or Joe Sr. because he was a step down. Right. So it's just like, this is an age old story. Yeah. I think the part that like he may die in war, it, that's the part that feels so bad. It's like, she's not killing him, of course. But yeah, just, it feels like she's like plotting for his death. And yeah. It's, it's not that. It's a much more. It's just like, if I'm going to marry him anyway, I better marry him before he goes off to war. Rewind. Let's talk about the actual freaking wedding day. She has no friends there. She has no personal nothing. It's This is not a ceremony like representing her love. This is a ritual task. A practical, you know what move. I'm saying? It's just the next move it's in strategy. her plan. Yeah. yeah. It's so cold. So then you think, okay, the wedding day. Marie Bruce said, oh, Rose, if you would just see them, you would see how happy they are. You can be happy for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. I was going to say that about the grieving (laughs) process. I think that her staying in England, she was still trying to hold on to that and figure out, okay, what's my next move here? Because I'm not going home. I'm not going back to America. That's one thing I'm for sure of. She's grieving her dream of becoming the Duchess of Devonshire. Even when you see her trying to figure out if she should marry Billy or not. And then after she does marry him, writing letters back home to Joe Sr., Rose, her brothers. It's not this genuine like turmoil, torture to her core. She just wants both worlds. 
it's it would be great if you could get over what you're upset about because I don't have a problem personally. Yeah. And when Joe basically gives her that, she's so happy and runs to write him a letter and send it off. And she's so cheerful. Yep. And then she was like, well, I'm so distressed about mother. Are you? Because it sounds like you're just waiting for them to get over it. The only way that this marriage is worth it for her is that if she is getting the estate out of it. Yeah. And the, because the, the position, the... Lady she, Hardington yeah. and Duchess of Devonshire. Because she had a lot to lose. She had so much to lose, so much at stake, I know. and she was willing to risk it, and it was not for love. If there was any love at all, it wasn't proportional to what she was giving up. If she was madly, deeply infatuated in love with Billy, that would make sense to me still. Okay, you are giving up your family, you're giving up your belief. People do that all the freaking time because they fell in love. But kick. Did not fall in love. <laughs> not like that. All of the historians that I've read agree that those infatu- infatuation in love feelings were not present. It's just you have to just jump through so many loopholes and you have to try to create some type of explanation where she really did love Billy and it was all about that. If you just look at the facts and you just read the story for what it is, like an investigation, like you said earlier, it's clear. But I'm still so confused about the whole family thinking that she's some saint. I think that they're just biased. But they're not with other people. You know, they're not totally out of touch with each kid and who they actually are. Kind of. Joe Kennedy later on wants to cover up Trapaquitic because it's Ted. It's his baby boy. Yes, but to Ted? He's saying, why did you do this? That's You're true. my least That's shiny true. penny. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like he, I think it was something about he was, that oldest, most potential. Like I think that is kick, so confusing to me. The way that they talk about Jack makes sense. The way that they talk about Joe Jr. makes sense. All of the others, I understand, and it it falls in line with Kick. They're so, and it doesn't make any sense to me because Joe Jr. and Joe Senior both say oh my gosh, there's no question at all about Kix standing with God. She has way more chance of seeing the pearly gates than I do. That is the most confusing thing to me. That Where is the evidence of that? Because she's said to be like such this rule follower, such this morally wonderful person, but then she's a rebel and she's the most wishy-washy person. She's the least stable. She seems the least committed to anything. Yeah. And you see... Joe Sr. get annoyed by those types of traits in other people and the other siblings. But with her, he's all constantly telling her, you're doing amazing, sweetie. You don't need to change <laughs> a thing. You're tops with me forever. Yeah, why? I don't understand that. Yeah, there's something about her that we're just not understanding. It has to be just the charisma, the enchantment that we always talk about with Joe Sr. It doesn't make sense, but it's like this, yeah. this aura. And then Maria Sieber, I think her name is, that they met in Cannes where she's like, I would give any remaining lamb to be one of them. She said that Kick, in her description of each of the siblings, she said that Kick was the one who had seemed to have grown up too fast and matured too quickly because of it, you know? Yeah. Because she had to assume Rosemary's role as the eldest Kennedy daughter. I I see her wanting to hang out with older people, wanting to be around people that she felt like had it all together and she wanted to be like all like Murray Bruce and Lady Astor. But I don't see behaviors from actually her that are super mature. You know? I mean, compared to Joe Jr., definitely not. Compared to Jack, I think that she could she could definitely present a lot more mature. Yeah. Presenting, I guess. But yeah, internally, her internal dialogue does not seem mature at all. And maybe too compared to the other girls. Like sometimes the things on the surface level that make you think someone is intelligent or put together or mature are not like just talking less or just carrying yourself with your shoulders back and, and, and walking in a certain way. Those are the things that people read into too much, you know? Yeah. Put too much weight in for sure. Because it just gives this image and it feels... Well, and people kind of did that to Jack too. They did the opposite. Exactly. Like they gave Kick a lot of 
respect and thought that she was more mature than she actually was. And Jack, they didn't respect as much as they should have. When and they did not bet on him when they should When there have. was so much there. Yeah. Because he presented more messy. With Chappaquiddick, Joe Sr. is trying to freaking cover this up for the world. And we'll talk about that later. Like way but, later. <laughs> but in the context of their family, he's like, Teddy, what are you doing? Why are you doing this to me? You know better. Like he's, he's being honest. Like, yeah, you're screwing up. Either stand up on your own two feet and join along with the rest of us. Or I'm not going to have gonna time see me for much. you. Yeah. <laughs> but with Kick, it d- it seems that Joe Sr. sees her in this amazing light still. And I honestly think that, you know what? Joe Sr. sometimes did really freaking have motivations about image and potential. And I think that Kick had a wonderful, bright personality to do a heck of a lot and to look really freaking good in the world and to be somebody and that clouded his judgment about who she freaking actually was. Because Teddy wasn't freaking amounting to anything publicly. And maybe too, it was the whole overworking versus underworking. Because Kick was still going off and doing things and meeting people, networking, going to parties. And so for Joe, that was enough of doing something with your life. Kick was still around important people and important events. And like you said, had the potential to do a lot, even with those selfish motivations. She was still involved in the Red Cross, was still hanging out with Winston That's Churchill and saying. all of the important political people within Great Britain. In the future with Chappaquiddick, Teddy is not doing those things. He's just like creating a mess for why. The difference is perception. And also- No, it's just like justification. Not, I mean, a little bit perception, but also just justification. Like Teddy, you're clearly just making a mess of things and Kick is- is doing fine. It wasn't she about was being a righteous, morally wonderful person. It was about going out and doing things. Mm-hmm. I don't think we can put a lot of that in there. Why? Because freaking Ted killed someone. It doesn't make sense how we're being so harsh on kick. It does. You think? I mean, she's totally freaking screwing someone over pretending like she loves them and she's going to present them with a life of emptiness. And, you know, I mean, signing yourself up to be in a relationship where you're not really giving any, you know that you're not going to give anyone what they need or want out of the relationship. That's horrible. It really just does seem like she was looking out for a number one. So that could be one explanation. Just people's observations were not accurate. Another one could be that she, she was, it was a lot easier for her to hide her intentions and her personality when she was younger because she was getting all of the praise and all of the fun and the glory out of being the more mature, the more stoic daughter. And then when that kind of got old, she she shifts into a more indulgent lifestyle. And it kind of feels like she is in a very long, drawn out process of that flipping. So next episode, we will talk fully about her fully manifested, full-grown rebellion. But she finally commits. Yeah. But she is in this like decade period where she's she's, one foot in, one foot out. Yeah. And she's like not trying to decide. She's just trying to be both people at the same time, I feel like. Yeah. And maybe too, she's one of those people who kind of reflects the room or she becomes different people, which people say about Jack as well later on in his adult life. Yeah. That he, that everyone saw a different side of him. Mm-hmm. No one truly knew Jack. No one truly knew Kick. Everyone, she kind of presented in a way that made her feel good about herself with whoever she was in front of. Yeah. Kick wasn't Kick wasn't Kick wasn't Kick. Even compared to Jack, which he does make questionable decisions and he does make a lot of decisions because it seems fun or to gain something from it. he's more honest about it. He's so so honest about it. And he is never trying to just convince everyone else to change their life, to change their beliefs, to fit his. And genuinely wants to help other people Mm -hmm. and goes above and beyond in his work and his service. Which we're going to talk about. Yes, but we don't see. There's just none of that with Kit. Even with her doing all of the Red Cross stuff, it's, so that Her she can get to England. Her only way to get to England. 
the whole time that she's there, she's not talking about, oh, all of these poor people, I can't believe we're in this war. It's so distressing. Jack and Joe Jr. are talking about it. What What's happening overseas? It's horrible. I have to stand up for this. This is not okay. This is not right. If all of the tens of thousands that they're flippantly talking about want to get home as much as the seven I saw on my ship, they better choose their words carefully. And then when she does share her most deepest regrets and emotions, her one regret is not, I wish I would have been with Billy faster or sooner so I would have had more time with him. I wish I would have told him not to go. I wish I would have told him to stay in politics. I wish I would have loved him harder, would have loved him for longer. None of that. Her only regret was that she was not pregnant with his baby. I do want to address that Bethany and I seem a little bit harsh. And if you compare us to the book Kick by Paula Byrne, she seems a lot more on Kick's side. She sees her point of view. She sees her gaining freedom and independence and going off and making her own life. But other historians, i.e. Barbara Leeming, i.e. Lawrence Lemer, the culture, the decisions, the events, the letters, it seems that the motivations are clear. I agree. I think that Kick was one of the Kennedys who wrote the most, and she has extensive journal entries where you can get a really good picture. It's not just secondhand or friends of the Guessing members from events. that ha- got their feelings hurt from her. It's her writing down her thoughts and feelings very plainly. The redeeming quality in her and and she she's a fairly good sister she's a fairly good daughter it's not like she's some horrible awful no I think she genuinely loved them I think she was also a selfish person Mm -hmm. and hadn't decided that she wanted to move on from that yet I just would like a little bit more honesty about what she is wanting in each situation I just think that the whole dance between like, oh, what should I do? Should I do the right thing? Should I respect my faith and my parents? Just say you don't believe that and just do what you want to do. It's this whole like masquerade, I feel like. Yeah, I agree. Where it's just not honest. With Like just be who you want to be. She either wasn't being honest with other people about her motivations and what she actually wanted. And she was just really good at using her charm and manipulation to get what she wanted. But she knew the whole time, like she was conscious of it and what she was doing. Or she wasn't being honest with herself and she didn't know who she really was. She didn't know who or what she wanted. She didn't know if she was capable of love or what that felt like. And so she was kind of constantly going in and out of like being sure of things and then not knowing and then deciding things and then being like, wait, is this for real or not? Which totally lines up with the Enneagram 7, the Peter Grace saga. Right. Constantly trying new things, constantly looking, chasing. And not just being able to think about it, decide, or feel things, decide. She has to like try it out physically every single time. And then she still doesn't know. (laughs) Or she just wanted everything, which also goes along with an Enneagram 7. Why would she choose one or the other when she could be, when she could have both? I think there's like this pride or this kind of delusional like d- detachment like we talked about in the, in the Enneagram 7, KFM 7 episode where it's just like she, she kind of was detached to the point where she's like, okay, I think I can just kind of like spin all of these plates at once. Like maybe I can just orchestrate this and just have it all. Which Joe Senior was kind of that way as well. And maybe that's part of the reason why she thought she could do that. So even to her own family, she's kind of pulling strings, manipulating, saying the right things to the right people. And I kind of think it was a to combination. To keep them on a string. Yeah, I think it was a combination. Yeah, she didn't want to lose anyone. She's using her confusion to give herself an opportunity to talk to other people to get them to see her side. I don't even think she struggles within herself as much with her decisions. It doesn't seem like it. It seems like the whole time she's quote unquote struggling with her decision, she's just trying to convince other people to be on board with it before she pulls the trigger so that they won't be upset with her. And I think you see this played out in multiple seasons of her life with multiple different things. One of the clearest examples is with Billy before she gets married. She's asking everyone under the sun. Oh my gosh. Do you think that this is fine? Do you think that that I can do this. She writes in a letter to uh, to Jack. She 
writes to Joe Senior and Rose about it. She goes to see the priest. She has her she mom's like friend that write a letter to to Rose about it. It's just like Marie exhausting. Bruce. Yeah. So she, then she goes no. to a different. They said no. Just accept that. They their opinion was you shouldn't do it. She didn't want to hear that. So every time she would either go to someone else or she would just continue to argue with them about it. I'm not expecting her to just be a family girl, be a Kennedy woman and just choke it down like Rose was expecting. Again, I think that that is fine. I don't think that there's necessar- necessarily anything wrong with a- an adult person going against what their parents said. You don't always need to take your parents' advice. For sure not. But and you sometimes also- you need to tell your parents, I am my own person. Yes. Please stop. And healthy boundaries. Yeah. And all of that. And, but And, and fi- finding your own beliefs for yourself. But whoever you are, you need to be okay with however they are going to interact with whoever you are. Not trying to control, present a false front to control how they are going to interact with you. Right, exactly. So I think that that's, yeah, where we kind of judge Kick more harshly. It's like she's playing with everyone else. Like, you don't get to be everything. You don't get to be Protestant and Catholic, you know? And she's holding tight to these Catholic beliefs and everything that the nuns have taught her, yet she's also seeing how far she can go. It does feel, if I was someone that was close to her, it would definitely feel like I'm being jerked around 24-7. It would be yeah. emotionally exhausting for sure, especially as serious as they were about Catholicism. I mean, it was a serious matter. It's not like they didn't care. Like it was, it was taking a toll on the family. And it's exhausting trying to talk to someone who you feel is not being honest with you or not having a legitimate conversation. Like, are we playing pretend here or are you going to actually talk to me? Because that is, it's not exactly gaslighting, but it kind of is that feeling. You want to shake someone's shoulders well, and like, be you're like, you're playing me. She, yes. You're, I know that you know that you're either not being honest or you're not taking me and my relationship with you seriously. Yeah. Like, like you, you, you don't really tell care. when someone's not telling you something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or when they're kind of putting on something or where they're like, oh, yeah. And it's super totally. frustrating because you're the one who came to me to ask me for advice. I'm giving you my honest advice and you're either completely shutting me out and saying you just don't understand or you're asking me to bend my belief in order to accommodate your beliefs and she's like, that's not how the world works. You're asking me to play pretend, basically. Yeah. Another example that I think portrays Kick's inner thoughts and like what she really cared about. And also, I'm just trying to piece together too, like why I gave Joe Jr. so many excuses and like advocated for him and thought that he still had a good heart, even though he also made some very questionable decisions, specifically pertaining to Nazis and Hitler and thinking about that. When Joe Jr.'s thinking about it, he is really processing it, trying to analyze, like, is this a good thing? Is this not? And trying to figure out what's best for others. Trying to figure out what's best for others. When Kick hears about all of this kind of stuff, aka is invited to Lady Astor's house and then becomes best friends with Lady Astor, who is the unofficial Nazi headquarters in Great Britain. The unofficial official. Which you just think about that for a second. That's Not a place you want to be. No. Wait, what year would that have been ish? Like after Joe? 40. 38. I'm, if I'm not mistaken, Jack went on that trip with Lem in 37, I think it was. And Joe Jr. went in 32. So way before everyone knew who Hitler was. So Kick has the least excuse. And especially Nazis. Yes. So Kick has a better idea, A, of who the Nazis are and what that means. Yeah. I mean, people know about it enough for her to have that reputation, especially she's hanging out with them. Shoot. And we we didn't really rag on her for that. No, but, but now you, that I'm thinking about it, I'm like, that is yeah. the difference. That's the difference right there. Joe Jr. is trying to figure out, is this going to be okay for the world and for people and for the greater public? And what's my part in that? And how can I help? And should I support this? Should I not? For others, like, what do I believe? Kick doesn't care about what she believes or who believe who, who will be affected. Yeah, who will be affected, who the people she's hanging out with, what they believe. She didn't care about that. She just cared about having fun. And that's the difference. I feel like that's a good example. Because I'm still trying to piece together, yeah, like why do we feel like that so strongly about Kick and not the others? 
It really is just their heart and their mentality. The motivation. You can be led astray and make mistakes when you're trying to do good. Yeah. Good We're all human intentions. Yeah. But when you're not trying, it's harder to make excuses or. Yeah. It's harder to have grace for someone who isn't even really trying to do the right thing. Yeah. I want you to remember that we know a lot more than you do at this point because there are two more episodes dedicated solely to kick coming up. And so I wanted to grab a little excerpt from Cassie's script in the next episode to put in here to give you a little bit of a better understanding. Because for us, it's really hard to separate who kick is and and what we know is coming. Right. Because we already have to have those scripts ready and we kind of go over them together beforehand to make sure that we don't fall behind in episodes. But then whenever we're in the KFMs, it kind that of all information together. is already in our brain. Right. And in the next episode, Kick's intentions become even more clear. So we're kind of using that yeah. as a basis to for filter this. the current events. Mm-hmm. So in episode nine, Cassie writes, by this point, her identity as an established English woman seemed to overshadow the American left in her and her independence seemed to be eclipsing her membership in the family she came from. She told a friend during this time, it's rather nice not having to be a Kennedy. Lord knows there are enough of them as it is. And I've kind of gone back and forth, you know me, always trying to figure out like what is right? What is the best way to be? What is a more pure heart and what is the best use of your time on this earth. So I feel like we're judging kick based on the belief that it's better to use your life to serve others and to love others. We're here to be in community and of service. And it's not all about us. We are not like the individualist mindset. Obviously you need to be healthy. You don't need to hear me say that's spiel about putting an oxygen mask on yourself before you put it on others. But with that as a basis, Obviously, yes, take care of yourself, but also live your life in service to others and kick out of all of the Kennedys did that the least. And even when she was, it was, I don't know. There was all, always an ulterior motive. Yes. And it just seems like Jack, Joe Jr., Joe Sr., Bobby, Eunice, they, Jane, Teddy. Jane, yeah, Teddy. And, and their children were all living in such pure, loving service to others. Did they make mistakes? Yes. Were they horrible people at times? Yes. Were they selfish at times? Yes. But it's like that home base, that foundation was always, I'm here for a bigger purpose. It's not all about me and my needs and what I want. What can I contribute? And kick was more, what can I consume? Yes. What can I get? What can I take so that I'm fulfilled? It's literally what Jack said. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And we definitely don't expect everyone else to also have that belief. That's just more insight into where we're coming from. But I also do want to give a moment to the fact that though Kick didn't have all these overwhelming, emotional, loving feelings for Billy, there was still a certain camaraderie, a certain friendship They had a lot of similar experiences. They grew up in a similar way. They kind of both were the acting firstborn of their family. Billy was actually the firstborn and Kick was the firstborn daughter who was capable of carrying that responsibility. And I think that they did really bond on some level. So I kind of want to talk about their environment growing up, kind of what was expected of them, how they like fit into those roles. And then also their dad, Billy's dad, trying to help him and coax him in his career. It's very different than how Joe Sr. treated Joe Jr. and Jack, et cetera. I think a lot of what they bonded over might have been their relationship with each of their families. They both had a lot of siblings. They both grew up in like a upper class family who also had a huge reputation and and things were expected of them. They both understood also what it was like for the general public to be coming for your family and to have lots of opinions. And I think that maybe that's part of why Kick was so ready to marry Billy is because she's like, okay, I am prepared for this. Like if anybody can be the Duchess of Devonshire and stand up to the criticism and like blossom under pressure and have to carry this heavy crown. I've been freaking basically doing that my whole life. Right. But the contrast is crazy too, because though it was such a similar situation, the 
freedom versus the staunch, strict, buttoned up suffocation of the English versus the American. I mean, they are literally quintessentially the most American Mm -hmm. and the most British versions of this big, important family. Kick grew up with all this freedom and it ended up kind of making her a bit wild, wild, narcissistic, a little bit frivolous and careless. Billy grew up under this staunch, just these very unemotional, you're not a person, you are a role, you are a title. And it really destroyed his ability to have freedom, to have emotions, to know who he is and to experience life in that way. So both of those spect- or the, it's like they were the two extremes of that spectrum. Mm-hmm. So they were fire and ice, but they also understood each other. I think two kicks saw a lot of Joe Jr. in Billy. And you know that whole like you're looking for your. Oh, yeah. Your father or your brother Mm -hmm. in your spouse. I think that Billy being the firstborn and having all of that pressure, all of that weight of being the firstborn male in an upper class family like that, that weight really does shape who you are and your personality and how you see yourself in the world. And Joe carried that weight like it was his number one reason of living. So did Billy because that was his, like that's what he was told was his number one purpose was being the next Duke of Devonshire. Mm -hmm. So I think all that also played into the attraction. It felt safe. It felt familiar. And yeah, she really, I think that, yeah, she did respect that. And that's what I was going to say. It was respectable to her. That was a respectable way to be. Mm -hmm. I do also think that that American versus English contrast. Yeah. Contrast and stereotype was a lot to do with the two fathers. Billy's dad, he just had such staunch expectations that could not move to accommodate the child. They were just very rigid. And yeah, sterile. It wasn't a lot of warmth and love and emotion. And and maybe Billy's dad put that on Billy because he kind of felt like he had to do that. Like he didn't want to be the Duke of Devonshire. He didn't want to freaking own all these houses. It, It was honestly not the life that he wanted to live. And he turned to alcoholism to cope with that and to be able to kind of carry that role that he was given. But it wasn't who he wanted to be. It wasn't who... He was at his core and he felt like if I had to freaking step up and just deal with it and put my feet in these shoes, then I expect that of you as well. And Joe Sr. very, very, very much got to live the life of his dreams. He got to be who he wanted to be. I mean, that dude... I feel like he probably left the earth thinking there's nothing more I could have done that I wanted to do. Like I I did it it all. all. You can see how that affected the kids mentally because Billy was a shell of a person, did not have a lot of self-confidence. Didn't didn't have a lot of interest or identity. Yeah, didn't have a lot of self-love and was not obsessed with life. And Kick was the exact opposite. She was like wild in every opportunity she was taking. You see that with all of the Kennedy kids. And there was just a an excitement and a fun That was just not there for Billy. But I think that that was Billy's biggest attraction or the reason that he lit up so much with Kick was that he finally was was given permission and to be whoever he wanted to be. Given the example of of fun and Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I even just looking at Billy versus Jack and Joe Jr. in their approval or like wanting the approval of their father Billy wants the approval of his dad still. It's just a sad, heavy weight, and it it looks a lot more gray and a lot more negative. And then whenever you look at Joe Jr. and Jack wanting the approval of their father, it feels like they're like trying to reach for the next level so they can like life rise to the yeah, the expectations that their father has for them and they want to eclipse each other. And and maybe it's also the like Jack said. Joe Jr. and his relationship with all of his siblings kind of gave them that like inspiration and a call to rise and to be better 
it's like a call of nobility. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then with Billy, it's. Well, I think it's a crushing weight. It, it's like the opposite. It's like yeah. pushes you down versus pulls, pulls you up. up. And I think it goes back to the dads, honestly, because they did set the tone for the family in both of those family dynamics. And Joe was constantly building his kids up and yeah. loved them for mm -hmm. who they were. So when the and kids told were, them that over and yes. over and over again. So when the kids were doing what Joe Sr. wanted them to do, they wanted to do they wanted to be there and they knew that their dad wanted to be there oh and so it was just on both sides this is fun we're enjoying our time together oh my gosh yes that's what it is billy's dad didn't want to didn't it's like he didn't find even enjoy joy him. in yeah. his son so and he's like why am i trying to please i'm trying to please you because it's my duty but it's not you don't want to be here either yeah neither of us want to be here and, and joe senior had so much fun and had and gained so much joy. And he wasn't From being a father and from being, from hanging out with his kids. Literally yeah. just hanging out with yes, them. Yes, that, that's what I was going to say. It's a foundational, I love my kids no matter what. I can be disappointed in your actions sometimes, but I'm never disappointed in who you are or your, your you did, being. You, they never questioned if he loved them or not. He, they might not have his respect at the moment, but they would have his love no matter what. And Billy, I don't think felt that ever way. felt to like you even really care that I'm around or that I who I am. Yeah. You don't even care to, to get to know who Billy is oh. as your son. You just care about teaching the next Duke of Devonshire how to be. Dang. So it's interesting to compare Kick and Billy and honestly, just the Kennedys versus the Cavendishes. But it's also interesting to look at those firstborn traits because Joe Jr. is the quintessential firstborn, people-pleasing, rises to the occasion just once to be the golden child. And Billy's trying to do that as well. Rose is also a firstborn. Oh, wow, yeah. And she is definitely, I mean, she was sort of people-pleasing God. Like, yes, her she was trying entire to reason for being was to please God. But it wasn't even yet to do the most righteous, just, morally correct thing. It was to make God happy. So to make God proud of her. Maybe that's what it is. It's more like you want your parents to be proud of you. You want God to be proud of you. That's that oldest sibling, deep core desire. They really don't want to disappoint. Yes. And you see that too with Jackie and how she, I mean, so fed into Janet's approval yes. and Janet's love and affection. And, and did it so well that Lee didn't have the opportunity to even play the game to ever even get any sort of approval from her mom or her dad. Like Jackie was that wonderful, perfect kid in her dad's eyes as well. And just, I mean, she was like playing that, like she was born for it. She was born for it. <laughs> like all the stars aligned for Jackie. So you see those examples and they're such, yeah, good examples of those firstborn traits and motivations. And then you see Kick trying to be that way because she's not actually the firstborn. She's not even the firstborn daughter, but she's sort <laughs> she's of like literally given the fourth this, kid. Yeah. She's given this responsibility by default because of Rosemary's situation. And she's like trying to be a people pleaser mm -hmm. and she's trying to act like she cares that, ever, she's that everyone trying, else approves. Yes. But she doesn't actually care. That's that they what it is. She's trying to, to play the game of making sure I get everyone's approval and I'm like living up to this mantle of the first, the eldest Kennedy daughter. But she really actually cares for that. Not at all. And her decisions are not it just makes her more miserable and everything more confusing. Like that's, I feel like another one of the layers that, that make her decisions so like foggy or just, just be honest, just be who you freaking want to be. She's trying to, she's trying to care the, about what people think. I mean, just like gender influences your personality and mm -hmm. how the world perceives you. We know that, that the same thing, it's kind of the same thing for birth order. Your experience as a baby really draws that out in your personality and it's part of why your personality is shaped that way and kick didn't get that experience she didn't get those formative years of i'm the the oldest one i have to take care of all these babies all these little kids are younger than me they need my help she didn't get that but yet she's expected to rise to that later but that wasn't her personality because yeah your personality is literally a culmination of 
nature and nurture. So mm-hmm. it's what you're born with and your your natural temperament, but it's also the environment that you grew up in. And that's, a lot of that mm, is formed like in the first two years. Most of that is formed in the first few years of life. So yeah, it's like they set her, she's kind of set up for failure as well. Right. Because she's she's gotten something thrown on her. She's gotten a responsibility that she did not get trained to be able to carry out. Jack's experience, Jack doesn't have those formative years where he is responsible and is acting as the firstborn. In he doesn't fact, have, he's very, very shielded. largely shielded by the, from that. And says that over and over again, mm-hmm. that he did not have to. He was shielded from so much of the pressure. Joe Jr. was the one responsible for all of the other siblings, um, for building them up. For teaching them the right way, for for carrying their sins. on the name, for <laughs> for becoming president. I mean, none of those expectations were put on Jack whatsoever. Jack was free to be whoever he wanted to be because Joe Jr. had it covered. So yeah, Jack was able to have all of this freedom, and then he comes into that later in life as well, like Kick. That oh shoot, my brother's gone. I am now the, the next oldest, in line. Yeah, I am now the heir to the throne, and I have to decide, am I going to try and fill Joe Jr.'s shoes, which people are literally telling me I need to do. Mm -hmm. And people were telling Kick she needed to do with Rosemary. But Kick kind of started thinking about maybe I want to do this. And then basically you'll see next episode, her choice. And in the next few episodes, you're going to see Jack's choice and how different they took on those responsibilities. And being the same personality, it's really interesting too, because they're different genders. But they're both Enneagram 7s and they're both not the oldest and then having to step up into that. Join us here next week to hear all about Kick's ultimate betrayal and the death that made Jack question everything. Thank you all for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please give us a review on Apple, rate us on Spotify, and share Blood and Business with a friend or a sibling. If you'd like to support the show, the best way is to become a patron of Blood and Business. You will get bonus content every month, including a monthly bonus episode, interactive main episodes, and behind-the-scenes footage. To keep up with us day-to-day, you can follow us at Blood and Business on Instagram and TikTok. You can find the link for Instagram, TikTok, and Patreon in the show notes below. Thank you so much for the support and we will see you back here next week for your regularly scheduled programming on Blood and Business. Dude, I've been on my water game. Really? I have not. I've been drinking a gallon a day. This is a half gallon, right? On purpose? I don't know. No. Just chugging it? Yeah. thinking about why yeah <laughs> i'm thinking about why i've been checking it if i got jams with the podcast it would be this <laughs> okay we need to move on because i'm literally about to cry seriously <laughs> from dust <laughs> to dust baby yeah for you <laughs> cry out the toxins <sighs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm pooped. I guess he's fully crying. <laughs> oh, that's next episode. Yeah. Well, Eunice. Take Eunice, for example. Oh, shoot. That's next episode, too. <laughs>